Schoolyard Sports Studio. Here's Steve Kaplowitz and Adrian Broadus. Ah, welcome back, everybody. Good to have you here on a Wednesday afternoon. I was looking behind the glass to see if I found uh, Michael Plundo hanging out, but no Mike today. He'll be back. He'll be here soon. Um, oh. Run a little late, Steve. Oh, so he's actually on his way today. Yes, he still is on his way. Dedication, man. Dedication for Michael Plundo. Will he be back to do bottom of the hour Sports Center? That's a good question. Maybe he'll make it right by the cutoff. Um, I'll tell you well, this. we got to have the dream team here, us four here in the mix, the four horsemen here through the summer. If Michael is not able to make it back for do- bottom of the hour Sports Center, that means Alberto Urueta will handle the job and deliver Sports Center, right? Yes, sir. That's what it means. Yes, sir. Mix that is exactly up. what it means. 100%. It's How you a, doing, man? That beard and mustache is growing out perfectly. Uh, are you? Does it ever get to a point where, like, it's it's itchy in the beginning, and then after a while, you just get used to it. It gets comfortable for you. Yeah, at the very very beginning, I, I kind of like the five o'clock shadow. I'll get kind of itchy. Yeah, and, but then how long does right. it take for you when the itchiness goes away? Generally Probably speaking, like three days. Oh, that's not, not bad. Not bad. No. No, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. And you've been uh, growing that thing now for about what two three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, did you say that you, you had to go clean-shaven for what was the reason? Oh, yeah, the the Golden Picks, remember? That's right, the Golden Pick Awards. That was a while. A while that was. Ago. That was like about a month ago, right? You've been growing it out ever since? I think so. I Good for say you. Yes. Do you ever want to, like, grow it out to, like, Chef Ruli's? Uh I don't know if you've ever been to, next door to Ruli's, but, you know, Chef Ruli's has one of the biggest uh, beards I've seen in a while. It just keeps growing. Do you want, do you want one of those, or do you want to just kind of keep it, uh, you know, to a certain, uh, certain length? It doesn't get that long. I mean, I can try it. The thing is, it doesn't fill all the way in. That's why it looks weird. Yeah, you have gaps. Yeah, a lot of gaps. It's yeah. gappy still. It is. It is. Um, I wonder how you can fix that. Adrian, any advice, especially for you, since, you, since oh, man. your hair grows like wildfire on what Alberto could do to try to uh, you know, fill in the gaps? Well, I have, no, um, I have no facial hair, man, so you're asking the wrong. I've never shaved in my life, basically. I mean, like, I don't have to do this kind of stuff. I, don't, I wouldn't even know what it would feel like to have facial hair. So, so uh, I could just tell you what it's like to you know, grow hair on your you know, head, obviously, and have, have maybe a longer flow sometimes, but that's about it. How often do you shave, Adrian? Um, every maybe three days, maybe four days even. Have you ever tried to grow anything or no? Yeah, if I let it go for a week or so, it's just stubble. It's literally just stubble. Okay, so it doesn't look good. You no, look, it looks uh, awful. It almost looks like uncapped, and then all of a sudden you don't even want to bother. Yeah, it looks really bad, actually. All right, I understand. Well, listen, I, I was, you know, Plundo's growing it out a little bit. He's got, uh, he's starting to, to do the same kind of thing like you. His looks really good, too. Yeah, you like that? Yeah. And he, and, he, and he cut his hair. And he cut his hair, too. That's good. Well, the Dream Team will be intact sometime today, and then we'll get uh, an opportunity to hear uh, from Plundo doing Sports Center, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, anyway, uh, here's advice. You ready? You want to hear the advice? This is, by the way, from somebody who knows facial hair, my former partner, Chad. You ready? Here's what he said. Shave it. Let it grow. Shave it. Let it grow. Over and over till the gaps fill. That's kind of what I've been doing. Just kind of shaving it, shaving it. And then people, especially got, like younger guys will come up to me and they see that it's, that I have a beard and be like, what do you do? And I just tell them like, nah, man, I just shave. I just have it continuously shaven. Because when I was younger, my mom would be really mean, especially when it was coming in. She would just make fun of me. And so they don't like to hear that, though. People who can't grow a beard don't like to hear it. I just grow it by just uh, shaving. Does your mom give you uh, give you grief now when you show up at the house? Does she look at you and just and, and immediately uh, just you know take aim at you? Yeah, yeah, she's my biggest hater. I was, she, your mom is your biggest hater. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day when or yesterday when you guys were talking about weight. I was like thinking, I was like, yeah, when I put on any weight, my mom gets starts calling me. Out. What, what does she do? She call you like? Um, she just said, like I'll be like I like to hang out without a shirt, so. Oh, okay. So it's like I'm at home, and she's like, dude, look at you. You wow. got love handles. And it's never that bad, so I'm like. <sighs> You're thin. Yeah, I know. There's like nothing to you. That's why I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about. Man. I try to not let it get to me. And also the hair. By the way, thank I mean, you same for thing letting with me the know hair. that if I ever come to your house, I will make sure I do not remove a shirt around your mom. Yeah. That will be the case because that's, if she thinks that you have handles, 
Oh, my God. Yeah, Adrian, can you imagine if me. the two of us are over there? We're doing Sports no. Talk Live shirtless. I wouldn't be allowed in the house, man. Me neither. <laughs> you, you'd be at least allowed in the house. And you'd just be like, this, I don't, this abomination over here. I don't know about that. I feel like your mom, I feel like, you know, it sounds to me like my, my Alberto's da- mom will be, it'd be tough. My dad's had a beer belly f- that my mom's been trying to get rid of for the past 20 years through so, diet. And now he exercises a lot. Does but he? Does he still have away. a beer belly? Yeah, it just has never gone away. Okay, now he's in the paddle league. Believe it or not, he plays paddle three times a week now. I can believe it. And so he's been trying, really trying into that. doing it to get in shape, or because he likes it. He likes it. He loves it. Ah. Got really into it recently. Okay. When I left Houston three and a half years ago, or three years ago, he wasn't. I understand. He wasn't playing paddle three times a week. Hey, so here's getting my home qu- at eleven. Here's my other question to you: Is your mom like a model? No. Okay, well, no. the reason I'm asking is, you know, she's taking aim at you for your love handles. She's on your dad for her for his beer belly. And I'm, like, wondering, like, um, you know, is, is your mom like a, like a model? Is that, does she have, like, those kind of expectations? Uh, I, I guess, but she's, I mean, she's just, I guess, quick to call us out in yeah. the family. All right. Really quick. Boy, I'll tell you what. The uh, Udoeta dinners must be amazing, man. They might, they gotta fun. Be, they got to be epic. We do. Yeah. Uh, they do get interesting. I'm sure, do you have siblings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they get called out too? Yeah, my really? little brother, my sister. I mean, we all Adrian, get the same we treatment. Broad- we might have to go to Houston and broadcast live from the Udoeta house one night because uh, it sounds like that could be more entertaining than uh, the three hours we do here every day. So I don't think I've said this on the show yet, but I mean, I know Alberto's family through all his cousins, like all his cousins. I know his, you know, some of the girl cousins on his, his side or some of his uh, male cousins on his side. We all like kind of grew up same time in this on the West side. So we all kind of knew each other. And I was really good friends with one of his cousins, Alex. So I know bits and pieces of the Urueta family, and I feel like we need to just uh, find a way to crash like a family reunion. Like, forget the dinner. We need the whole household. They're all characters, like, in the positive way. It sounds like it could be a reality show. It could be. It could be. In a good way. Not in a bad way. In a right. Good way. In an entertaining way is yes. what you're telling me. And we me. get along, and, and That's good. it's a fun environment. It, I enjoy it when sounds we get ama- together. It sounds amazing. It is. I mean, we have a big family. That's the thing. My dad's got like six brothers. Okay, so it's a big so when you family. get so when you get a little get together, family get together, we're probably talking forty, fifty people. Yeah, yeah. When when it's everybody from yeah. out of town, yeah. Okay, but a lot of people have moved away. Well, all right, that's how it is. Well, but you guys are also moved away, right? Because you you now yeah. In so like my parents live live in Houston, uh, and then I have like cousins that live in uh, Oklahoma and stuff like that, Dallas. Right on. All right, good, 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 good. Anyway, thanks Not for sharing. Thanks for sharing a little bit. Now we know. started with your beard, and look where it's where, look where it's gone. It's gone all the way now to talking about the family. Mm-hmm. You ready for Sports Center? If we need you, yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we got a lot to cover on the show today. Jay Jaffe will be by in our four o'clock hour. No Jeff Erickson today at five, so we'll keep we'll keep you up till uh, five uh, with our normal uh, banter and topics. And then coming up at uh, six fifteen, we've got Anthony Reifenberg, who's going to be covering the rest of the week for Tim Haggerty. Hags is on his way to Cooperstown. How cool is this? He's going to be speaking uh, at the Hall of Fame as part of a seminar on Negro League players that are not in the hall but could be good enough to get into the hall. And he's got a pitcher that uh, played many years ago that he's going to be talking about, and uh, that is going to put him out, uh, out of town for the rest of the week. You know, Steve, we got to tell Jay Jaffe about this one here. I think Jay Jaffe will uh, find this news pretty interesting right here, uh, knowing his involvement with Cooperstown and all he does to cover the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, that's true. That is very true. Could be uh, could be the case. So um, I'm excited. I think it's going to be, uh, uh, again, uh, a great opportunity for Tim. It's going to be great for us to have the opportunity to talk to Anthony. And, yeah, excited, uh, ready to go, and should be a uh, terrific show. So, um, anyway, we've got all that uh, coming up on the program today. And then we'll, that also means uh, no story time with Tim this week. You realize that, right? That's sad. But maybe we'll get a, a two for next week. We could. Maybe he'll uh, maybe he'll listen to enough stories in Cooperstown where he'll want to deliver a good one to us. Maybe that could be the case too. So. I hope so, man. I, I mean, we're gonna miss Tim this week for sure. He never misses. That's another thing for our listeners to re- to remind them right here. Yeah. He hardly misses any and you know any single Chihuahuas baseball game, and that's a testament to his hard work. I worked um, two games 
for him when he was out years ago. In fact, I had Butch Henry with me for the games that we worked. That was a lot of fun, having Butch in the booth. Really, really enjoyed that. But now that, and, and I know we've also had Adam Young do games for Tim over the years. I think Duke has filled in at least once for Tim over the years. You know what would be really cool? And I'm just throwing this out there. To have John Teicher do a game. John did so many baseball Diablos games for so many years. He works at the ballpark now anyway. How great would it be if on one of the days he's out, we get John Teicher to fill in and call it Chihuahua's game? Imagine for like UTEP night. That would be awesome. They do it for that UTEP night, even just for a couple innings. Come on. This is some free advice here. Let's go, Tim. Come on. John called the entire 80s and, you know, for for, uh, for the uh, Diablos. In fact, I, I you know, that's what we got to start here. That's how kind of things worked out for him. So that would be cool if John came back to do a baseball game. Yeah, I like the idea. I like the idea a lot. Um, Cody Decker coming back in the booth would be a lot of fun, too. That would be great. There's that some good op- there's some good options right there. Man, you imagine if Cody spent a, a game with Hags and what that could be like. They could talk about all the uh, Hag the informative Hag tweets yes. throughout the course of the broadcast and everything else that's going on. That well, would be amazing. Plus, Cody's you know not too far removed, so he probably has a lot of stories about some of these guys, and he has this window of opportunity now that you can't take for granted. So, like, I, I feel like we need uh, Cody Decker in the booth now. That would be terrific. Um, but we will have Anthony uh, Reifenberg uh, doing uh, the broadcasts, and he'll chime in with us. We'll find out what Anthony's been up to. I mean, I'm kind of curious about that, aren't you? Last time we really had a deep dive with Anthony was a couple of years ago, so maybe now we can catch up with him a little bit on the show today. Maybe he can deliver story time Friday. Maybe. Maybe. Do you think after all these years – do you think he's ever listened to our show um, in no. that part on Friday and, and would know what that's about? No, he's probably locked in, man. He's locked in, ready to go game days. I feel like that's the case, too. And Anthony only did story time once. And it... Uh, redemption time this time around. You think so? The redemption tour? Yes. Okay. I like that. I think that's a good idea. Hey, we can give him two days. Two days notice. Today, tomorrow. But when we tell him about story time... Do we at least preface about what Tim does just to give him an idea to try to find something for for uh, for two days? Yes, yes, that's, that's got to be that's fair. Right. Yes, that would be the the only fair way to do this. Okay, all right, I like it. I think that can work too. I do. So uh, we'll do that coming up on our six o'clock hour on the program. In the meantime, Twitter and X are always open for business. Six hundred ESPN El Paso on both. Plus, we'll get the opportunity to uh, get your comments on the phones at five zero five six zero zero nine and our free. App, which if you haven't downloaded, it's the best app around. I mean, the 600 ESPN El Paso app is my go-to for anything sports-wise as well as listening to the station. So strongly advise you to do that if you haven't done so already. All right, a lot to cover. Jay's next. But first, let's go to Charlie One and get our first traffic update of the afternoon. You know, the El Paso Metro Place, we're not doing too bad. However, in the uh, shopping area here at Gateway East and Hawkins, we have a crash. That just happened, and we have a PD going. They're not there yet. Not PD control, Gateway East and Hawkins on that crash. They're on the way, so cautious. In the valley, we have a crash at Bauman and Rankin. The Socorro PD are handling down. They're at the scene right now, Bauman and Rankin. Check I-10, Loop 375, doing okay. Pretty much of a decent drive right now. I don't see any major slowdowns uh, going on right there. In Leo's Restaurant, 7520 Rimcon, graduations going on today, tonight, tomorrow also. Congratulations, grads. Celebrate that special occasion at Leo's. We have uh, treat him or her to flautas, fajitas, chita con queso, steak or chicken breast, chita con carne, chicken and mole, much more there. Full menu, Leo's Restaurant, 7520 Rimcon, 21600 ESPN El Paso.
back here on Sports Talk. 20 past the hour right now as we continue. Time to say hello to Jay Jaffe, who joins us every week to talk a little baseball and beer on the program from uh, the team at Fangraphs.com. Jay, how are things going? How you doing? Hey, I'm all right. Thanks. All right. That's good to hear. Hey, by the way, um, I was wondering if you were going to be heading to Cooperstown because Tim Haggerty, who is the voice of the Chihuahuas, is out the next three days. He's actually going to be presenting at the Hall of Fame the best Negro League players who aren't yet in the Hall. So Tim, who's a part of the Sabre group, is going to be speaking about the great 1910s pitcher Cannonball Redding. So I oh, wasn't cool. sure if you were going to be uh, taking part in this uh, Hall of Fame deal, since I know you're you're there quite often, and this kind of stuff is always right up your alley. Uh, I won't be there for this particular thing. This is, I believe, this he, you're referring to the Jerry Malloy Conference, which yes. is the uh, the Negro League Study Group. Um, that's great that Tim's going, though. Uh, uh, I know a bunch of people who are going. I'm sure he'll have a great time. And uh, uh, is it Can- Cannonball Redding? Is that the one? That's exactly Cannonball yeah, Redding. He was, who's a hall- he was a Hall of Fame candidate on the 2022 ballot. Um, I wrote about him at length. Uh, uh, I thought he had a pretty reasonable case. He had, you know, his uh, uh, he was one of the best pitchers in kind of the pre-Negro leagues era, the early the the uh, the teens and the and, and then uh, into the early twenties. Uh, the start of the of the Negro leagues that that are now considered major leagues. Uh, he did uh, uh, a lot of pitching against semi-pro teams, though, and I think that kind of uh, confused maybe uh, some of the voters a bit. Um, but uh, he's one who I think probably belongs in the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, that's such a bottleneck, such a backlog of worthy candidates that we now know a lot more about than we did, say, 15, 20 years ago, um, that uh, it's going to be hard to get them in uh, given the, the way that uh, the structure has changed because they're competing for ballot space with uh, uh, the, the white major leaguers uh, – from before 1980, as well as black major leaguers from before 1980. So um, even just to get on a ballot, uh, they got to go up against the likes of Dick Allen and and uh, uh, managers and executives from the pre-1980 era as well. So um, it's a it's an uphill battle. But uh, um, you know the point of learning about these guys uh, en- enriches our knowledge, and I think it's great that the uh, um, that Tim is involved in in that effort. Last Thursday, you wrote about the story you mentioned with us uh, on our segment last week. You called it the day Negro League statistics met the major league record books. And it's exactly what uh, you said you were going to do. You really, you took a deep dive into this. And um, everything from all the different Negro Leagues recognized as major leagues, which you included in there, you included the comments from Major League Baseball and and uh, then you you went into everything from batting average leaders all the way to career batting average leaders, some of the statistics that are being affected. I feel like, uh, Jay, a deep dive like this was important just to really put everything that Major League Baseball did last week in the proper perspective about where you see things now and maybe where they could be going here in time. Yeah, I mean, this is a story I've been following pretty closely for the last Four years, you know, ever since Major League Baseball made its announcement that uh, um, that you know that they wanted to recognize the, the these uh, seven specific leagues as as major leagues, um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting story. It has a lot to do with uh, the archival work that a dedicated group of researchers uh, has you know has put together to compile so much data. We've got about seventy five percent. Uh, of the box scores from the 1920 to 1948 period for these leagues, um, and we've, we're still working. People are still working to find more. Um, probably never get all of the ones we want, but uh, uh, it really has uh, bolstered the legends of a lot of these players here uh, by giving us the actual numbers to, to back it up. Um, you know, one thing that I, t- I took issue with both in this announcement and in the, in the 2020 announcement, is the way that Major League Baseball has worded this, uh, which has kind of let themselves off the hook uh, for creating the conditions that caused, uh, you know, the, the, the need for, um, for a separate Negro Leagues to, to uh, exist uh, while the white leagues were segregated, um, and to 
uh, not distinguish between or to, to be very cavalier in the distinction between something that is a major league record, as in inclusive of all leagues considered major, and a record of Major League Baseball, capital M, capital L, capital B, the corporate and legal entity that represents the current American and national leagues. And I think that uh, people have to be very careful in the way that uh, MLB has kind of usurped that because Josh Gibson did not play in MLB. He played in a major league. He played in several major leagues, but he did not play in Major League Baseball, capital MLB. So um, I think we have to be careful with that. I don't think we should be letting Major League Baseball off the hook for not rec- for not doing a better job to uh, explain to people with this whole thing why you know, it was it was the one responsible for this. At times, do you feel like they blur the lines between the two? Yes, absolutely. And I think that Major League Baseball's public relations department learned nothing from 2020 when they said they needed they they wanted to elevate uh, the Negro Leagues to Major League status. And the feeling was that the Negro Leagues didn't need elevation; they were on they were already on par. Um, you know, the statistics show that they were actually beating their white counterparts in head-to-head all-star matchups, and uh, um, the caliber of play was was very high. So um, people took issue with the language then, particularly a lot of the black writers that I I read and follow and uh, black commentators, and I think we, we really do need to be sensitive to, uh, you know, to their, to their perspective in this because, um, you know, they have a much better understanding of what it was like to go, to go through all of that and to live in segregated times and experience the, ra- the, the racism that, uh, um, you know, that kept these leagues separate. Jay Jaffe with us here on Sports Talk as we continue. He held a chat yesterday on Fangraphs. That's online at Fangraphs.com. Also yesterday you wrote about Aaron Judge, and it's a great story because I know there are a lot of Yankee fans that in April were definitely concerned in a big way about Judge's uh, start to the season. He was not hitting over 200. He was not hitting with the kind of power we're used to, and people were wondering – is uh, you know is essentially a judge on the decline. Is he's over thirty? Are you starting to see him uh, maybe go downhill with that huge contract? And then all of a sudden, May comes. He sets a new record for Yankees for most extra base hits in the month of May. Breaks Babe Ruth's record. He's continued here in June, and now Aaron Judge is on uh, another ridiculous pace as we head into the summer months. Yeah, he has just been absolutely phenomenal lately, and it's funny because, you know, when I wrote about him in April, uh, it was right right at kind of the low point of the season, and he's turned it around in such dramatic fashion since then um, that I've been kind of keeping tabs dated to that point, and I use that as a reference point in the in the article. We talk about arbitrary end point sometimes. Well, this wasn't quite an arbitrary end point. It was an end point where we had a detailed set of observations and measures, and, and I use that as kind of a, 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 a yardstick to compare uh, the before and after. And I found that, you know, Aaron Judge is swinging more aggressively, you know, going after p- p- more pitches in the strike zone and more pitches in the good part of the strike zone as opposed to just on the on the uh, uh, outside corners. Uh, he is absolutely hitting the snot out of the ball uh, with an average exit velocity of 99.5 miles an hour. Um, he's already on top of the uh, – leaderboards and exit velocity, barrel rate and hard hit rate, the areas that you really want uh, a hitter to be excelling. And what's what's great about it for the Yankees is that Juan Soto is second in all three categories. Those guys are just a, um, a, a two-man wrecking crew. Um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, we're seeing him do a better job of, of pulling the ball, doing a better job of hitting to his sweet spot, which is, uh, uh, as, as he said uh, last year, he wants to, he, he wants he thinks about decapitating the second baseman with his swing. He wants to kind of drive the ball to right center. Um, that's how he gets himself uh, mechanically aligned. Um, he's hitting more balls in that direction. Fortunately, no second baseman have actually been harmed in this effort. Um, <laughs> but that is that is his cue uh, for his swing is to think along those lines because it gives him a target uh, to set his body as to as to where he wants uh, that swing to to end up and to meet the ball. 
Add in the fact that uh, Giancarlo Stanton has 15 home runs right now for the Yankees, and Anthony Volpe is doing a really nice job in the leadoff spot getting on base so that he can get, uh, you know, they can produce those runs. And that's one of the reasons why I guess the first five, six guys in the Yankee lineup has been so productive. Yeah, I mean, they're right now they're the best they're the best uh, record in the American League. They're tied with the Phillies for the best record in the majors. They've had a lot of pleasant surprises on both sides of the ball. Uh, Volpe's development is one. Um, John Carlos Stanton's comeback is another. Uh, uh, Luis Heel um, pitching uh, as well as anybody in baseball right now, making a case to start the All Star game. Yep. Uh, and this is the fill in for for Garrett Cole, who himself had his first rehab start. Uh, the other day and is, is working his way back towards the Yankees, probably coming back uh, uh, by the end of this month. And, uh, yeah, it's you know there's a lot to be uh, excited about for them right now uh, with the way things are going. No doubt. More with Jays. We keep things moving at the bottom of the hour. But first, let's go to Michael Plundo. He's standing by with this Sports Center update. From Fangraphs.com, follow Jay on Twitter at J underscore Jaffe, and you can check out his work. And also, uh, again, stay tuned for his beer pick of the week. He'll give us that selection coming up at the end of our weekly chat as we continue. To Capita Marcano, Jay, he will be uh, no doubt a uh, trivia answer for people years from now. Funny enough, uh, and this was this is a really weird situation, but think about this, okay? I'm going to put this into perspective. Ducapita Marcano played for the Chihuahuas back in 2021 and was Uh. injured, but it looked like he would have been back this year, okay? Um, We've also seen, um, I believe, let me get everybody's name. Jay Groom. Uh, Jay Jay Groom Groom would have been there. That's right. right. Jay Groom is another one. And also, and that's not enough, okay? We've got one more who is connected to the um, El Paso (laughs) Chihuahuas uh, from this group of people. Oh, that's That's right. That's wild. There is another minor leaguer, Michael Kelly, who's with the A's now, but pitched for the Chihuahuas in like 2016 and 2017. So three of the five, two of the minor leaguers and one of the uh, big leaguers in Marcano, all connected, uh, having played here. Isn't it crazy? And I wonder, is do you think this is going to be the start of something, or will this be just an isolated incident when you start to realize how much, how easy it is, I should say, how easy it is for anybody to to, to place wagers now for sports? Uh, I doubt this is the last of it. Um, you know, Major League Baseball has been up to its eyeballs in, in gambling-related uh, stories since the start of this year, going back to um, the uh, – uh, uh, illegal betting done by uh, Shohei Otani's uh, translator uh, using uh, money that he de- defrauded from Otani. Um, that involved illegal bookmakers in California, and there's a big investigation that has uh, focused on several other players. Uh, minor, uh, minor leaguer David Fletcher, former Angels uh, shortstop, now in the Braves system, uh, is one of them. Um, but uh, that that is separate from from this situation in which players went through uh, the the legal routes. Um, the thing about that with the legal routes is that they are cooperating with the professional leagues and uh, they can flag irregular behavior and uh, they got your information. So it's not that hard uh, for a league to find out that uh, uh, that a player is making bets and uh, basically that's that's prohibited. Um, if if they're betting on uh, baseball at all, um, it's a one-year suspension. And if they're betting on the team uh, for whom they're employed, uh, it is a lifetime suspension. This has been a bright line, uh, no-go for players for over a century. The Rule 21 is posted in every clubhouse in uh, English and in Spanish. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for these players. Um, this is not something where despite Major League Baseball's involvement uh, with the gambling books, which I do not like at all, I do not like the pervasiveness of the advertising or anything like that, it has never been the case that this uh, made it okay for players to gamble um, because they should know from the beginning of their time in professional baseball that it is uh, off-limits to them.
Are you a believer that if you gamble on baseball, you should be out for life, not just a year, the way it is now? I think it's you bet on your own team, you could face a permanent ban. If you bet on the game away from your team, you could be facing a one-year ban. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's what I uh, yes, I, I am I am absolutely fine with that. Um, I think that's a I think that's a great a great rule. Okay, um, you know because I think that the one thing. The one thing above all that, that leagues have to do is protect their integrity, uh, so people you know, believe that this is a contest uh, based on skill rather than a fixed outcome like professional wrestling or, or something like that. Which, hey, you know, it's fine if you want to be entertained by that, but uh, you can't really have gambling on that when the outcome is fixed. Uh, very um, true. Very very true. So uh, you know, I you know, I. I Again, I think this is this, this, these rules have been clear. Uh, Pete Rose has been made an example, uh, among others. You know, we've got the the Chicago Black Sox, Shoeless Joe Jackson and company, uh, from back from 1920, and a handful of other players uh, uh, in between those. It's unfortunate that it comes to this, but um, really, you know, there's the rule is quite clear, and uh, there aren't exceptions to be made here. In uh, about three minutes. Paul Skeens will take the hill against the Dodgers in a very, very interesting matchup. Skeens has been so much fun to watch out of the gate. The Dodgers, as you mentioned earlier, right now one of the best teams in baseball with 38 wins. How excited are you to see this game and and see what Skeens can do against one of the better offensive lineups that he's going to face all season? Yeah, should be should be worth watching. I haven't I haven't really gotten to see more than highlights from him, so yeah, I'm eager to check this out here. All right, what are you going to be working on this week at Fangraphs? Uh, I am right right now writing about the Blue Jays dabbling with uh, Vladimir Guerrero playing third base. Uh, it's uh, not something they're probably going to do very often. It's just kind of a window into what's been a very strange and disappointing season for them. Uh, they're underachieving. Uh, on both sides of the ball, and this is a way to try to get a little bit more offense in there, but it kind of a, amounts to rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, not gonna, It's not going to be enough to turn this team around, but uh, um, at least Guerrero is doing well, and that's that's something because he had a, a kind of a down season last year. So uh, a little bit closer look at him, and I'm not sure what else I'm going to be writing about for Friday here yet. Didn't Vlad come up as a third baseman in the minors yep. before they switched him to first? Yep, he played. He played uh, every defensive inning that he played up from from the time he was signed in 2015 to uh, the end of his rookie season in, in in 2019. He was a third baseman, and they made the move in in 2020 during uh, summer camp. Um, and he's been at first ever since, except for a couple of two inning late uh, late uh, game cameos. Um, but uh, he still takes ground balls regularly at third base. He had a very nice play uh, in the first game uh, that he played. He only had two chances in each of the two games that he's, that he's played, but he had a spin move uh, when he was positioned over where the shortstop traditionally is in kind of a in a legal shift um, and on, on a ground ball. And, uh, um, you know, we'll see if he can do it. The defensive metrics were not kind to him when he was, when he was a third baseman. Um, they can probably afford to get by with it uh, uh, in isolated incidents, but I don't think it's going to have a big impact on, on the Blue Jays' season here. It's more of an interesting curiosity than anything else. Jay, let's wrap it up. Beer pick of the week. Okay, this is from the Ebbs Brewing Company, which has a tap room at City Field. And while I haven't had a chance to visit the City Field tap room, it does look good, and I am a uh, regular consumer of their beers. They have a very distinctive black and white packaging, um, uh, in which uh, their beers have uh, fancy names. This one is called IPA Number Eight. <laughs> this is uh, they just they just number them and uh, uh, give you the style, like Kolsch Number Two or Ghost Number One, IPA Number Seven. I'm not sure how many of the IPAs they've had, but this is their eighth edition here. This one uh, is a hazy seven uh, percent ABV with. Uh, um, citrus notes. Uh, I get orange and peach out of it. This is, I think, one of my favorites of the ones that they've had. Um, I haven't had a bad beer from them, but I really did like this IPA, and I'm going to go back for more. Sounds terrific. Jay, enjoy it. We'll talk to you again right back here next Wednesday. All right. Sounds
Sounds great, Steve. Thanks. Jay Jaffe, folks, from Fangraphs.com. You can follow him on Twitter and X at J underscore Jaffe. 41 pass. Back with more in a moment. Sports Talk continues. 600 ESPN El Paso. In the El Paso Metro Place, what we have is a crash. Uh, this one just happened on the west side, so I want to get to this one first. Mesa and Sunland Park, but Mesa and Sunland Park, uh, PD going out there. They're not there yet. They're not uh, controlling that, so caution as you approach this one. This will be on your northbound lanes of Mesa, southbound lanes of Sunland Park. That's Mesa and Sunland Park on this crash. PD not there yet, so caution. Working on the crash gateway east and Hawkins will have PD presence. In the valley, we have Bauman and Rankin, Socorro PD handling that crash, so they were pretty much okay on I-10. Don't see any major slowdowns yet. Keep an eye on that. Leo's Restaurant, 3520 Rimcon. Thousand graduations, one going on tonight at 7. More tomorrow. And uh, congratulations. Grant, celebrate that special occasion at Leo's Restaurant. We have the uh, treat him or her to Falcons, Mahitas, Chile con carne, chicken breast, chile con queso, straight uh, steak. Don't forget that uh, famous tortilla soup. Leo's Restaurant, 3520 Rimcon. Charlie 1, 600. ESP El Paso. 48 past the hour as we continue. I had no idea minor talk is coming up next until I just heard that uh, little note from Freddie. That's good to know, Adrian. Yeah. And Kim, what are you guys going to be talking about today on minor you talk what, since you're, you're coming up next? You know what? We are we are coming up next. Uh, no, I have no clue what we're talking about. Actually, you know what? We, we can continue to talk about the CUSA TV deal. We can talk midweek games. We can talk all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to make sure that this one doesn't play again until uh, maybe the football season starts. That might be a good idea. Table it till the football season? Maybe so. But we'll, we'll still have some good stuff on the Minor Talk podcast channel. You just won't hear any Minor Talk until August 31st on this radio station. There you go. Unless, if you ever decide to have like an emergency Minor Talk in the middle of the summer, then you could play that Freddie Coleman clip and uh, we'll be all set and good to go. Yeah, good idea. And, and there could be an emergency Minor. We've had to do those before. We had to do one uh, at the end of 2023. So there you go. You never know when, when that's going to happen. You, you really never know. So keep an eye on that one, folks, as we continue here on the show. Or an ear on that, I should say. Not an eye on it, but an ear on it. Um, meanwhile, yesterday we had Jorge Vasquez and Jim Center in for an hour to talk about the proposed Sun Bowl uplift. Uh, again, I'm, I'm looking right now at the meetings that are going to be held for the – El Paso County Bond Advisory Committee. Tonight, they are going to be meeting in about 40 minutes at Ben Narbuth Elementary Gym. I have no idea where that is. Tomorrow, uh, all these meetings are from 530 to 7, by the way, all of them. Tomorrow, Eastwood Middle School Cafeteria. Ben Narbuth Elementary School off Vista del Sol, close to the SAC. Thank so you. for Far East Siders, there you go. Saturday, 5.30 to 7, EPCC Northwest Campus Cafeteria. Tuesday of next week, June the 11th, Isleta High School Band Room. Next Wednesday, Chapin High School Cafeteria. Those are the remaining meetings. For the Sun Bowl uplift. You know, Steve, uh, I had somebody, I have a source who was at last night's meeting. There was a meeting last night in Northeast El Paso. EPCC Trans Mountain Campus. Correct. And they were at this meeting. They told me that it was their largest attend- attendance yet with 30 people. 
Wow, it's good. I mean, that's I guess that's good attendance for a meeting. And 30. so I, I asked her, you know, what do you think about kind of the thoughts about the Sun Bowl? Would you did anybody bring that up? No, wasn't brought up. Sun Bowl uh, uplift was not brought up throughout the discussion. More on the topic of why is the county spending X Y Z and what can you know taxpayers do to influence things like that? I got a t- I got a tweet, um, and this was I guess yesterday. And I saw this from David, and it said, As much as I enjoy going to UTEP games at the Sun Bowl, I won't be voting in favor of this come November. I live in Fabens and work in San Eli, both of which are in great need of infrastructure improvements. The county should tend to those needs before anything else. Yeah, and it, you know, I can I can understand his sentiment. This is coming from a legit UTEP fan, and he's telling you, "Hey, wait, look, look at my own backyard. I need to prioritize this right now." People in Fabens, people in San Eli, they might have different opinions on this based on their own priorities and what they can and can't do right now on a day to day basis. Meanwhile, this comes from Clyde the Budo. By the way, I'm following Clyde. I'm now the um, tenth person following Clyde the Budo. So thank you, especially when I saw that his uh, Twitter and X handle says, yes, it's me, the real Clyde the Budo. When I saw that, I'm like, all right, I'm following you. I'm number 10. Congratulations, Clyde. Clyde says, what do you say to the El Pasoans that say the UT system should be helping cover the cost of upgrades? Selling the ownership of stadium to the UT system for so little, what does UTEP get? From the UT system. Why did El Paso make that sale? The reason El Paso made that sale, the county did, was UTEP asked for it. They wanted it. They wanted control. They didn't want it uh, to be under county control. But the problem is, let me say this, okay? And Clyde the Budo is right. Since the county sold the Sun Bowl to the UT system... They technically don't have to do anything. Neither does the city if they don't want to. They don't own it anymore. If the county owned the Sun Bowl, maybe we would have seen improvements years and years and years ago. Who knows if they would have been in control versus where it is now. It's such an interesting conversation because you always wonder, what if? What if? The county never essentially gave the Sun Bowl to the university. Yeah, and and it's also interesting when Jim Center brought up other precedent of, you know, UTSA is already doing this right now. They've uh, tapped into governmental resources to try to help improve their facilities. So, um, you know, for UTEP, he was encouraging El Paso and even saying, hey, look, this needs to be something that is city, like like a, a commitment fr- by the city, by the county, um, you know, to improve this. And people need to get on board with this. This is what he was arguing yesterday. And you know what? I'll be honest when you see other uh cities like san antonio commit to that then it makes you feel like well if they could do it why not el paso 2001 is when the county sold the sun bowl back to the university and i thought it was for like a dollar i forget what it was it was for some ridiculous amount of money that was like so low you 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 just say to yourself and by the way in 2001 that's when they removed Hundreds of seats to reconfigure the stadium for soccer. How many soccer matches have we had since 2001? Maybe le- you know, f- less than five, haven't we, at the Sun Bowl? Sounds like a handful, like from what Alberta's suggesting right there. Yeah, but the point is, when they did that and they, and they reconfigured it for soccer, the, the thing we were told at the time was there would be more and more soccer matches being played in the Sun Bowl. We haven't seen that. And... That was when they reconfigured the uh, the stadium. So, you know, you think about that. 23 years ago, they had an idea to do things to bring more soccer matches to, um, to the stadium. It didn't work. And now you want to try to do something else that you hope will bring those A-list acts. But as you could tell from what Adrian just said a little while ago, there's not a lot of people going to these meetings, and it wasn't even brought up. So it makes you wonder... Will the Sun Bowl uplift even get on the ballot 
And if you had to ask me right now, the answer is probably no. Yeah, and will El Paso back it? I mean, there's so many things. Yep. You could even uh, throw in the track record that you know we've recently seen, whether it was uh, the failed downtown arena project, whether it was the streetcar, which people feel either way about that as well. I mean, people look at these projects and say, well, those didn't work or maybe aren't working, so why should we buy into this right here? All right. We'll come back. Hour number two right around the corner. Uh, no guests. So if you want to weigh in on this and any other topic, 505-6009, lines available. Sports Talk continues. From the 600 ESPN El Paso, River Oaks Property Schoolyard Sports Studio, here's Steve Kaplowitz and Adrian Broadus. All right. Hour two of the show is underway. Welcome back, everybody. We have two others uh, with us right now. Alberto Arueta, Michael Plundo. They're both very interested in the Paul Skeens-Los Angeles Dodgers matchup. Skeens apparently mowing down Mookie Betts and Shohei Otani to start the game, boys. Yeah, struck out Shohei Otani on a 100 miles per hour pitch. I mean, he's just dueling right now, Steve. I mean, the first three batters are Mookie Betts, um, Shohei Otani, and Freddie Freeman for the Dodgers, and he got all of them out. Nice. So, And I saw he's already struck out Will Smith and uh, Gavin Lux. So, so far, seven up, one hit, and that's Jason Hayward. And other than that, he's been retiring everybody. He's got four strikeouts uh, through two innings. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's still living up to the hype when uh, advertised before the season started. He's still going out there strong. Uh, I'm really curious to see how the Pirates manager, Derek Shelton, manages his play going forward. Because if you remember earlier in the year where Jared Jones was having a similar play style, they still kept him, you know, through five innings. You know, they don't want to risk any injury like Tommy John because these pitchers are so young and so important to the team. That's true. Not to mention his stash is so important to the team. It's a big stash. That's an important stash. It really is. If you're going to grow it, grow it right. And he's definitely done that. And that's uh, I feel like all these all these fans are showing up wearing mustaches today. You know, they're all they've all got the Skeens uh, stash going. Yeah, I mean, uh, as we saw in that uh, Twitter clip of that kid, I mean, he had his own Paul Skeen stash of his own. I mean, so he's really had an impact on the city of Pittsburgh so far. You could tell. Would you consider shaving off your beard and just growing a mustache in honor of Paul Skeens? Honestly, Steve, you yes, can call honestly. me a. You can call me a Paul Skeens fan all you want. I'll do it. I will do it. If it means he can stay in Pittsburgh lifelong, I will do it. Okay, that's good to know. Um, Adrian, take a look. I haven't looked at, uh, I haven't looked at um, uh, Plundo in a while. Does it look like if he shaved off the beard today but kept the stash, it would definitely be Skeens worthy to get started? Uh, not to get started, but he's, he would work on it. He's had it trimmed like nicely. It seemed like it was professionally done. You know? Okay. So he hasn't really grown it out. He's not. Uh, it's not a bushy mustache right now. It's an, or a bushy beard. It's very trimmed. It's like a trim beard. Oh, very nice. Um, Alberto has a. Uh, I mean, what would you say? How would you rate your uh, mustache? I, I don't like on a scale of one to ten. Yeah, probably like at a four or five. Okay. In what regard? Good. I mean, it's not bad. No, it's that's not low. you got good, that's you got good low. coverage. Okay. No, yeah. I've seen. Is my dad used to have this really big, th- thick one? So it's like. Mm. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Would you ever like, want to just like? You know, uh, grow it and uh, maybe do something kind of crazy and funky with the mustache or no? Like a little circles at the end? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like that looks really cheesy. Raleigh Fingers did it for years in baseball. He made I don't it, look think it would look good on He me. waxed that thing. Maybe just like a, what's it called? Um, a Magnum P.I.? Oh, you want to be the Tom Selleck look? Yeah, Tom Selleck's not. There you go. That's, hey, that's, that's you want to, if you want to model look. yourself after somebody, Tom Selleck, that's good. Mr. Magnum, I like that. Um, lots of comments coming in on Twitter and X. We'll read those in a little bit. But first, let's begin hour number two on the phones with Cruz, 505-6009. Welcome aboard, Cruz. How are you? Thank you, bro. Hey, I'm doing all right. You doing okay? Doing good, bro. Thanks for the call. Yeah. Hey, uh, I was. Uh, I want to make a comment, you know, about El Paso. You know, we're a low-paying area, and then we're, we're not in the middle of Texas. We're way out here pretty much isolated you know we could draw from las cruces and we draw some but you know they draw some from us you know uh fans and people that you know that attend our games and people south of the border when i went to college they were just interested in getting an education and taking off you know we're not surrounded like most of the you go to san antonio and they got people all over the place up and down interstate 35 and across on interstate 10 and uh you know, it's just a, a low-paying area, and and we, we don't have a lot of cities to draw from. You know, and uh, that that hurts quite a bit. You know, if, 
I, I wish we could we we could all get together and and, and donate and and then vote on this and pass it and and help UTEP because uh, it does bring the money to, to El Paso as well because people come in from out of town. But um, I don't know. I, I've seen over the years, you know, where, where we try to draw people, but we, we need to uh, field winners too. That that'll help us out a lot. That would definitely help. There's no doubt about that because then you'd start putting money into the program, which it so desperately needs. Although, think about this. $99 million, I mean, if you're, a, if you're a good, if you have a good year at UTEP, you're in the black, right? You're in the black. You're not in the red. But even, that's, uh, even that being said, like, UTEP is not the kind of school that's going to be making, you know, 10, 15, 20 million a year in athletics. They're just, that's just not going to happen. You just want to try to stay, uh, you know, stay above the negative. So that's why, again, the, the amount of money that they're looking for, and they even said that the total cost is like, Two hundred million dollars. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a ton of money when you're thinking about it. It's a ton. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking maybe if we can get like the football team, the volleyball team, men's and bas- and women's basketball teams to, to attend some of the the games throughout El Paso. Uh, go to some basketball games and football games, and uh, uh, you know, support our community that way, and and hopefully that'll. Uh, People would be more interested, and I I don't don't know what to say, what to do. But Cruz, they man, do. It, they got listen. When it comes it, to UTEP games, uh, the athletes and other sports attend them all. I mean, I always see the a lot of the athletes going to the football games. I see them going to the basketball games. I'll see them at the soccer matches. I'll see them at the softball mm-hmm. matches. Athletes tend to go out and support other athletes. That's pretty commonplace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So appreciate yeah. the call, man. Thanks for getting in. We'll talk to you later. Five oh five. Six zero zero nine. Let's go next to Lance, who joins us. Hey, Lance, thanks for the call. Hey, Steve. Hey, Adrian. How you guys doing? Doing well, thanks, Lance. Hey, man, I wanted to talk about this uh, Sun Bowl uh, renovation uh, proposal that's been uh, talked about lately. Uh, you guys were mentioning a few minutes ago before the break about uh, the seat configuration being changed in 2001 for more soccer matches of I heard that it's probably been maybe less than five. I can remember three of them that I'm aware of, which one of them I'm actually going to in about two and a half weeks. I mean, this this town is a big soccer town. Uh, I don't understand why uh, efforts aren't made to bring in more high-profile games, or even you know friendly matches, or even yeah matches for like the like the Gold Cup. Uh, you, know, you see some matches in in Austin. Or smaller places like that. Yeah, you know El Paso is a big soccer town. Well, here's the biggest question, Lance. Here's the biggest question from for this. Okay, and that is, they already have turf on the field, right? So I don't know if that turf is removable as easy as it would need to be. Because if you want to start doing Gold Cup matches and things like that and exhibition friendlies between the U.S. and Mexico, you need grass. And you don't have natural grass at the Sun Bowl anymore. You have their turf. So uh, knowing how expensive irrigation is, and I've seen natural grass at the Sun Bowl before. It's happened, but they they took it out. And I don't know if there's even um, you know irrigation in place to handle that. So if you don't have that, you got to water it with hoses and everything else. I mean, just think about the cost to bring in a grass field. I mean, that's again, I don't get it, man. They they soccer sized it, but when you start thinking about their their field turf and what they have, a lot of I've heard a lot of clubs don't want to play on that because they don't want to deal with those little rubber uh, pellets that will get in your face as you're running up and down uh, trying to play soccer. I mean, I can see that point, Steve. But I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I think some of the bigger uh, stadiums, like you know, in Dallas and New York. Uh, I don't believe those are natural grass stadiums. I think is that the same uh, type of turf that UTEP has, or maybe is it, a well, different type of upgrade? Yeah, if they're playing on field turf in those in those venues, especially for like FC Dallas and uh, and, and and New York, and then yeah, you have a really good point. I, I don't know. I haven't watched a, a ton of uh, of MLS to see how many of their fields are field turf versus natural grass. It's a good question. But I mean, in general, I mean, if you look at AT and T Stadium, 
I know Mexico has a contract with them that they play at least one game there every year. And I can remember in 2014 when they were getting ready for the World Cup and they played Ecuador when uh, Luis Montes, uh, you know, broke his leg. And that was not on a natural field. That was on uh, that, that turf play. By the way, we did some research, just so you know. And I'm going to give – I know also Alberto's chomping at the bit to get in on this conversation. As of September of last year, all but six MLS stadiums use natural grass. The others use that artificial turf, which you talked about, which is because uh, the venues are shared with other sports, such as uh, you know American football. Like Charlotte FC and the Panthers both play at Bank of America Stadium, which switched from natural grass to, to, grass to turf three years ago. Um, installing natural grass at a stadium can cost between $600,000 and $900,000. I see that point, but also Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte does host uh, quite a few games, whether it be Gold Cup or friendly games. And if they're playing on that type of turf, yeah, I don't see any reason why you can't book high-profile games here, and, and it will draw. Good point. You're right. Alberto, give me your thoughts on, uh, on what Lance is saying. Yeah, I mean, when you start running the numbers of how much it costs uh, to bring soccer, I mean, to, be, to bring grass to the Sun Bowl, it kind of makes sense why you don't get any teams to come play here. If if you're going to tell the promoter it's going to cost you six at least $600,000 to get real grass in here, you haven't even paid any teams, you haven't even done anything, most guys are just going to tell you, yeah, it's not worth it, and that makes a lot of sense. But I do remember I do remember the Luis Montes bit. That guy's uh, a, a local here. Uh, I, I was watching. I was listening to that game on the radio with my dad when that happened. It was really sad when he got injured. I remembered that. But, yeah, it, it is sad how underused the Sumble is for soccer, and I think that's also a, jo- a promoter thing. There's not someone who's interested and is going to put the money to bring in these organizations. And as far as, you know, tournaments, I said it last time, you know, you're swinging for a Copa America, a tournament that doesn't really play in North America historically, but you're – you, you go to the Gold Cup, that's a smaller tournament. I feel that if the city were to send out a commission of these tournaments and, and ask them to bring a, a game here, that would be a reality, in my opinion. I think that the city is not something it's doing right now. I don't think the city is going out and meeting with the, 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 the organizers of these tournaments and asking them to bring, tournaments, uh, to bring tournament games here. And so I think that's what's happening, even though the, the city can do it. You know, the Sun is a great example of, of uh, a big event that the city puts on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hey, listen, great stuff. Appreciate the phone call. Thanks for getting in today. We'll talk to you, Lance. Thank you, guys. You got it. All right. I'm looking at uh, last year's Gold Cup, and I was trying to figure out, uh, you know, SoFi Stadium, that's uh, natural grass, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Um, Allegiant Stadium is, I believe, natural grass. Yeah, remember they wheeled that one in? Yeah. Where is Snapdragon Stadium? Snapdragon Stadium? Yeah. Do we know where that is? Snapdragon Stadium? Doing a quick Google search on this one. Yeah. Uh, it's in San Diego. Okay. And I believe that's natural grass, too. I believe. Because that was also the host of a Gold Cup match. And then it, Shell Energy Stadium and NRG yeah. both hosted. Those are both in Houston. Yeah. So it is it is kind of interesting to see if, if they would play. See, I don't know. Would you play a, like a like a big time international match on an on an artificial turf uh, field? I uh, no, I personally wouldn't. You no, know, not you, but I mean, do they do they it. do they do that? No, players don't prefer so. it. They want to play on grass; it feels best. You know, it's it's what they want. But look, uh, turn stadium size. You know, you start looking at the list of stadiums that were used in the twenty twenty three uh, Concacaf Gold Cup, and you go to the very bottom, and look, they played in Fort Lauderdale. In the Inter Miami, that one only holds eighteen thousand. You go, they play in St. Louis at City Park, that one only holds twenty two thousand. You know, the Sumble dwarfs these stadiums, and it's a beautiful stadium. So, in my opinion, that's what the, the stadium should also be used for: soccer tournaments like this. And and it, it's a reality. In my opinion, it's a reality, and it's something that can be done. And it would put the city in, in a in a good view, in a good light. I just think that when you soccer sized it and you took seats out to make it conducive to soccer. They haven't, they haven't done in the last 23 years what they set out to do. And, again, it's not to say that this latest set of you know, $100 million to update the Sun Bowl would not benefit what they want, which are concerts and the A-list shows, but I'm just using that as an example of something that happened years ago where there was a goal in mind and that goal was not achieved. And there, because there really should be at least, let's be, let's be real, 
three to five soccer matches a year in the Sun Bowl? Yeah, and that just sounds like a reality. And even if they're not professional teams at the top level, you know, you bring in someone, you put on a sort, some sort of spectacle, and you bring some, some well, soccer matches. That's well, my opinion. America and FC Juarez is a that's, pretty. Uh, that's a big deal. That's a big one. But you it could. It, it's been. What was the last time before that the, the, so, the Sun Bowls hosted a soccer match? That Chivas game. Yeah. That was when I was still in high school. I was a sophomore in high school. That's that's the last time. That's huh? the last, if that was the last soccer game held at the Sun Bowl, I remember it, I was a sophomore in high school. What was that, about eight, nine years ago? Um, yeah, that was 2014, 2015. Yeah, it's almost 10 years ago. Crazy. All right, 19 past as we continue here on Sports Talk. More as we roll through till 6.30 tonight. But first, let's go to Charlie One and get a traffic update. 23 past the hour as we continue here on Sports Talk. 505-6009. Those are our telephone number, 505-6009. You can also get in, Twitter and X, 600 ESPN El Paso. Hey, I want to remind you, uh, folks, uh, a couple of things. Dining deals this Friday, 10 a.m., getting an opportunity to enjoy $50 from Track 1 for just $25. We've talked about Track 1 all week. Um, they're famous for their wings, but their nachos are amazing. Their sandwiches are spectacular. Everything they do, they do so good. It has It's one of the best settings you're going to find uh, in, in, in town. And uh, this is an opportunity to enjoy, um, again, great food. For the first time, if, you, if you've heard about Track 1, you've never been there before, Adrian, this is the best way to try a new restaurant. $50 for just $25. You know, I always wonder, well, why why doesn't Track 1 come over to the west side, uh, build one on the far east? Well, Track 1 recently launched their Track 1 truck, so they've actually had uh, their food truck out at our Cool Canyon Nights events. You'll see them around town. You might see them at Speaking Rock, one of our partners as well. Uh, but to, you know, to your point, Steve, we love their wings. They're known for their wings, and now you can even order on DoorDash, Uber Eats, or whatever those you know, delivery services there are from their food truck itself uh, and, and get it as fresh as you would in their restaurant. So that's track one for you. They do it all, and they're being real innovative with this new concept that they're launching this year. That's uh, Friday morning, 10 a.m. on Dining Deals. You can check it out at the Must Read Bar at 600ESPNLPaso.com. Also Friday, I will be uh, joining forces with Ray who hosts a podcast called Locally Sourced EP. In fact, you can find it on Instagram at locally underscore sourced underscore EP. Now, I had a chance to talk to Ray uh, a while ago. This was probably uh, you know some six months back, and uh, he has now turned this uh, into a podcast that will drop on Friday. We talk about everything. He's put a couple of clips up on Instagram. It's a, a great Instagram follow if you haven't done so already. And that is at locally underscore sourced underscore EP. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, was a lot of fun. Ray's a, a great uh, listener. He's a fan of the show. And uh, he does a terrific job with his show, Locally Sourced EP. Adrian was just happy to be on it and talk a little uh, talk a little shop with him, which is what you'll hear on Friday. Nice. I'm looking forward to listening. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this comes in on Twitter and X. Let's start with uh, first, uh, Steban. You want to upgrade the Sun Bowl? Permanent grass for all sports. That is something I would donate for. All right. So permanent grass is what he's saying, that that would get him to, to donate money. The reason UTEP switched out and went from uh, natural grass to field turf was cost, specifically the watering cost. Trying to survive that grass during the uh, hot months of, what, June, July, August, and then keep that grass year-round. Because remember, that grass needs to be green for football season and uh, then, you know, you really don't uh, you don't let it go dormant. You kind of keep that grass growing the whole time. So that's really the biggest reason why years ago they put in field turf and their artificial turf that they have right now. I don't think UTEP would ever consider back going back to natural grass. Never say never, but I just remember that cost was the reason why – 
they switched it out years ago. And, you know, I can't even imagine um, if they put natural turf back in what that water bill would be like to keep the Sun Bowl uh, looking good. Yeah, there's no way. There's just no way. Let's all pass it. Let's all be realistic here. Uh, how many? There are very few college football teams across the nation that have uh, legit grass fields. Iowa yeah. State, BYU, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee. What do they all have in common? They're all Power Five and they all have money. So they can you know afford to keep upkeep uh, of their turf. You know, UTEP struggling to put together this, uh, you know, uh, proposed uplift for the Sun Bowl here for upgrades that you know they desperately need the bathrooms, the locker rooms. Those are the things I was talking to my dad the other day, and he was just saying like those are absolute necessary things that they need to accomplish and probably needed to uh, over a decade ago. And that's that's the reality for those things for the Sun Bowl. Now I will say this because this is an important thing to note when you compare the two schools, and that is that um, you know Aggie Memorial Stadium. Uh, you look at what they have right now, and I believe at this point, I got to double check this, but they have, um, they call it hybrid Bermuda turf, which includes a quick draining system beneath the playing surface, which was the first hybrid Bermuda turf of its kind. I, I don't know, Steve. I'm almost. Yeah, I, I would think that that's almost like artificial turf, don't you? Right? Hybrid close? Bermuda turf. I know for years they had natural grass, but I thought um, hybrid Bermuda turf is artificial turf. I have to see specifically what that is. I know there's soft. No, real it's grass. an actual real grass. It's a real. It's real grass. Soft. Hybrid Bermuda turf is real grass. Softball, they, I, when I went to see their softball game, their softball is real grass, real dirt, too. Yeah. The thing is, uh, you guys haven't t- touched on this, is a real grass requires a full maintenance crew. Well, it's also, crew. listen, they're an agricultural school. Yeah. So, yeah. But if UTEP were to make alley. that sw- yeah. Now, listen, that's no excuse. You can't say, well, is that that's a good reason why NMSU has grass and, and UTEP has turf. But, I mean, let's be honest. When it comes to the two schools – in certain things you could compare, others you can't. And Mexico State has really good facilities. They upgraded yes. the Pan Am Center. They now have suites that are sold out at the Pan Am Center. They've done they've done a good job. And you know the 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 the, uh, the turf out there in New Mexico State. I feel like what Mocha has done is just try to get as much done for that for those facilities as he possibly can. And he's done a great job. I mean, I went to Aggie Memorial Stadium for the first time uh, last season to watch their FIU game, their game against FIU. And yeah, it's a beautiful stadium, not as big as the Sun Bowl, you know. Uh, it dwar- no. the, the Sun Bowl dwarfs it. 28,000, almost yeah, 29,000 for built, Aggie Memorial. And it's built into like a, a like a divot from a golf swing or something. But, yeah, it, it's cool. But, no, I, I, I love the beloved my beloved Sun Bowl, but – it is a beautiful campus, and, and I'll say this. Uh, yeah, their, their athletic facilities, I, I was looking around when I was at the softball. They have a beautiful practice field right behind it, and the baseball field always looks great. So, yeah, I mean, it's a full-time commitment to have your, your athletic facilities look like that, and it's also a huge uh, burden on your budget, I, I imagine. Well, let's also let's be real in one, uh, in one other instance. If you're going to compare UTEP to any school, the first one you should compare them to is New Mexico State. No. Closest school in proximity. They're now in the same league. They have similar facilities. The only difference is the Aggies have a baseball team. UTEP does not. You know, every time we go out there, they're always improving their facilities. So I'm not, you know, when I'm saying this, I just, I'm seeing conflicting reports. I saw on their website the hybrid Bermuda grass. I'm seeing other places they switched to artificial turf uh, in 2014. So well, I'm seeing different spots on this one right here. We, I, I think we just need to get to the bottom of this and, you know, reach out to Mario. I mean, I'm on their website. and Yeah, I see that one, and, too. And according to their website, the hybrid Bermuda, what year did they say that that was? They said that was put in in... I saw 1978 for that. Oh, did you? So, yeah. So maybe they did switch to uh, artificial turf. Maybe they are using artificial turf. Now, I'm not like sure. I see, two, I see two different things. I see two different reports. All right. Well, I'm sure they've got something. We'll find out. I'll find out what it is. Let me... I'll call Mocha right now during Sports Center. We've got Michael Plundo standing by, and then we'll have more in a moment. 600 ESPN El Paso.
It really is. And if to New Mexico State's credit, if they had some way of having grass, then there really isn't, you know, to your point, there really is an excuse for UTEP or, you know, ways to try to even explore those options right there. But I just feel like on the surface level, outside looking in, it's pretty costly. Yeah, I'm sure it probably is. And those water bills are not, uh, yeah, that's that's the hardest part. You uh, know, um, you know, it's interesting. Esteban chimes in and asked about El Paso golf courses. It's a great point. Those golf courses, though, Esteban, you look at the peak summers, they struggle sometimes unless they're owned by like a water company or something like that or they have resources to tap into. It's tough to water those courses. $60,000 a month is what it was costing the old owners of Butterfield Trail Golf Club to water that course. And that was before, that was when Kemper Sports was running it, okay? And Kemper ran Butterfield till about four or five years ago. And their water bill was over $700,000 a year. Almost, actually, it might have been more, it might have been closer to a mill when it was all said and done. Just for water. That's ridiculous right there. And and you think about operating expenses, priorities. You heard Jim Center give a list of priorities yesterday. So, yeah, I mean, I, I hear where people are oh. coming with with this uh, example right there. It's just tough. Here's what, here's what Mario said about the artificial turf, okay? It's about a million dollars, but it saves 10 years of maintenance. There you go. Yeah. There's your, there's your answer. Your investment right there. There is your answer. You invest for 10 years right there. Yeah. I mean, for the million dollars, yeah, you, there's no maintenance. You're, you're maintenance-free for 10 years. So, you know, that's the, uh, that's the deal. And the practice field is also synthetic turf. Used to be natural grass, but they did what UTEP did. They realized that it's just not cost-effective, especially in, a, in cities that do not get rain. Look, they don't get rain here, so you don't get any help. You know what we can really appreciate right now? The El Paso Chihuahuas grass. Yes. Man, that grass is always looking good. Let me say this. Shout out to the Chihuahuas ground crew, who also handles locomotive matches. Because for the last 10 years, that grass has been the best thing we've seen in this town when it comes to maintenance and it comes to playability. Nothing is better. And I, and I tell you how hard it is, because I remember when the Diablos were affiliated and independent at Cohen Stadium, how difficult their grass was at times to try to keep it up to speed. I remember that, too. I remember that, like, going as a kid and just re- looking in the outfield and being like, oh, man, yeah, look at that, you know? And it's no knock to them at the time. It's just, this is El Paso. This is drive city. Let's be realistic about grass and how much can grow and, you know, how much it would actually cost to grow it effectively. Yeah, it's true. It is true. So back to what we said before, okay? For cost purposes, I understand why the Sun Bowl is artificial turf and not grass. So the question is, now that you know that they're not putting grass in the Sun Bowl, how many, how limited are you with the soccer matches you want to bring to that stadium? Yeah, I think that that kind of chuck just ruin, not doesn't ruin everything, but it's just like, well, I'm sure most teams are going to tell you, well, if you don't have real glass, grass, we don't want to play there. So that's kind of just puts an end to that, unfortunately. Yeah. That's kind of why we are why we, where we are here. Only five, what, under five games have been played since 2001. It's been 20 years. How about this, guys? Eight of the 16 stadiums for the 2026 FIFA World Cup will need to install temporary natural grass fields. So maybe this is more common. Maybe that's the business we should do on the side is develop these temporary grass fields for stadiums like the Sun Bowl. Well, the other question is also this, okay? How difficult is it to remove the artificial turf that's currently at the Sun Bowl and then install and then reinstall it after the natural after the uh, you know the the temporary grass is is installed yeah good point I mean there's some uh, stadiums that have the luxury like Allegiant to just yep. roll in and roll out uh, fields or you know covers whatever it is right there but others I'm, I'm sure they aren't like natural grass you tell me Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City has the easy way to just flip turf uh, over to natural grass like that's tough right there I don't, I don't know how that's gonna work yeah I don't either that is that is a challenge uh, it takes money it takes a lot of money but you're right it can be done but it's not cheap. All right. And then you say to yourself, okay, 
So let's say you do that, right? And you bring U.S. and Mexico, and you do a, a friendly, and you have this a regular, you know, regular grass to play on. How much are tickets? When you're thinking about the magnitude of who would be playing and the amount of cost and all the expenditures to try to fit the Sun Bowl for the right playing surface and all that, what are you paying? You're paying 100 bucks a ticket, 200 bucks a ticket, and then are people upset that the tickets are so expensive? I mean, that's another thing you got to deal with. Yeah, real quick, Alberto. I know you're, you're, uh, you want to jump in here. To ensure the quality of pitches for the 16 stadiums, FIFA is funding research right now at Michigan State, and it's a multi-million dollar investment over multiple years to do uh, this turf grass uh, you know, kind of switch for all these different stadiums. Okay, so FIFA's covering, foot in the bill. They're, just for the research part of it, and then all the stadiums, they've got to pay for that whatever that traction looks like. Multi-million. Yes. All right. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this. It, we can all dream, right? We can all be hopeful that they come up with a solution. I don't think Yeah, you'll be my age when this happens. Yeah. And, um, no, I mean, look, uh, you were asking about prices to a, a hypothetical Mexico-USA game here in in, uh, in in El Paso, I paid $150 to watch Mexico versus Panama in the semifinals at the NRG in the CONCACAF. How many years ago was that? Not even five. Okay. Not even ten. So. Were you, would you have good seats for 150 yeah. yeah, it was like the third row. Yeah. So it was but third NRG, row. But at- NRG seats about, what, 70,000, 80,000 people? Yeah. Yeah. So now, now take that, divide that in half. So it's, but if you're dealing is, with 40,000, what's that? My, the game I went to ha- was a tournament game with elimination. Yeah. So it's, when you bring that here, that's gone. There's no and, – and also when the narrative around uh, friendly games like that is always like, well, they're not bringing their best players or they're not playing their best players. It's just not – that's always, you know, sometimes a narrative. But, I mean, if you haven't seen soccer here, you got to watch it. But, yeah, I mean, I wonder what's going to happen here in the coming years and – if they had widened, if they widened the entrance to the Sun Bowl like they want to with the Sun Bowl uplift, I'm sure bringing in grass would be a lot easier. No, oh, that's a good point. Maybe it would be. Maybe that's possible. But, but just to detail how complex this is, I'm reading right now. FIFA right now is having to work with outdoor and indoor turf because what will survive through the duration of the World Cup, right? It's not about just planting this grass there hoping it works out. No, it's about keeping it alive and making it survive a couple weeks yep. uh, in 2026. It's a good point. A lot, there's a lot of issues. So, all right. We'll come back, wrap up Hour 2 in a moment. We'll find out from Michael how Paul Skeens is doing against the Dodgers. Still more in a moment. Sports Talk rolls along. 600 ESPN El Paso. 49 past the hour as we continue here on Sports Talk. Just to be clear from last segment, artificial turf costs about a million dollars, but it saves 10 years of maintenance is what it does. So uh, I think that is the reason why. A million dollars seems uh, pretty cost-effective when you talk about what you don't have to worry about in terms of water bills and uh, manpower to try to keep those fields going. Yeah, and it's a true commitment by the stadium. Um, if it's a franchise that occupies the stadium, uh, if it's an entity that owns the stadium, it's it's a commitment, a financial one, by that stadium to decide either way, right? Um, I feel like for the you know long term investment, it's the turf way to go. But um, you know, for those who will have a diligent grounds crew, or maybe the conditions outdoors will allow them to, um, they'll continue to go with the grass. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, let's get. An update, Pirates Dodgers. What's uh, going on right now, Michael? So the Pirates are currently up seven to two in the bottom fourth. The Pirates went on an absolute rally in the bottom of the second, scoring all those seven runs, forcing the Dodgers to pull starting pitcher James Paxton. Paul Skeens still dueling, has gone through four innings so far, given up three hits. He gave up his first home run of the year to none other than Shohei Otani, and um, he's got six strikeouts and one walk. Our guy Nick Gonzalez is on fire. That former New Mexico State star has come up this year and looks like he never wants to go down again. He wants to stay and and occupy that second base position. Yep, you hit right on it. I've been really impressed with what I've seen from Nick Gonzalez so far. I mean, if you remember last year when he got called up, didn't really, couldn't really put it together, still struggled a bit at the bat. The defense was okay, but the Pirates wanted to see more from him at the bat because that's what they drafted him for. And this year, he's just been 
absolutely killing it. Batting over 300, stealing bases, making plays on the defensive side of things. So Nick Gonzalez is really starting to put it together. And Joey Ortiz is doing the same thing at third base for the Brewers. These were teammates at New Mexico State. Think about that for a minute. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to see a couple of former college all-stars that now have opportunities to become MLB regulars like they're doing. And they're both doing it as basically rookies this year with two teams in the NL Central. What a cool story that is. Really cool story. I mean, you even said it to your point about being teammates. I mean, these guys know each other very well, and to see them killing it out there in the league, it's got to make uh, NMSU pretty proud. I'm sure it does. All right. 52 passed as we continue here on Sports Talk. Saw this come in earlier in the show from Noah at Noah Guerrero. at no, the Noah underscore G, Noah Guerrero. He mentions, it's also interesting to keep an eye on the El Paso County Coliseum revitalization plan, an iconic venue that could affect how the county views the Sun Bowl priority. Now, I'm going to say this. All right, maybe it's because I called so many buzzards games over the years many many years ago and maybe it's because i've been to so many concerts in this venue for so many years but i'm one of the few people that are that's very partial to the coliseum i love the barn the barn i had so many great memories in that place sports music and i feel like they have fixed it up I also feel like people crap on the Coliseum for whatever reason. Maybe they feel like there's just not, you know, it's old, it's not as nice as some of the newer facilities. Look, there's something to be said about history. And this arena has been around for what, 80 plus years, and I like the Coliseum. So if they ever decide they want to revitalize it, I'm fine with that. It wouldn't bother me because again, um, I don't know. I've got a soft spot in my heart for a place that I've spent so much time uh, with over the years. I went to my first monster truck show there. There you go. Inside the Coliseum, so I kind of feel that sentiment. But it's also a, a venue that's been kind of left to um, its own devices, and then those devices aren't too modern. And I think that, you know, ah. a, a lot of uh, newer shows like modern modern things. So, yeah, yes. I mean, a lot of people see it as a competition, right? Uh, Noah Guerrero, he's right to bring up the amphitheater. It's kind of a bad time for UTEP to bring the Sumble uplift because this is coming off of the, 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 the announcement of the amphitheater. And it is some people are just going to say, no. I don't want the so I don't want to give the Sun Bowl 99 million because I already gave the amphitheater. The amphitheater is coming already. So if it comes, because remember the amphitheater is not being funded by public money. That's private. The one over at Cohen Stadium in Northeast that's going to be privately funded. Yeah, but there is, in my opinion, El Paso ones are going to be like that's our, the amphitheater is already here. Why would I give taxpayer money to the Sun Bowl if UTEP can do it? You know, they're just going to blame it off, and then so yeah. that's how I think it's kind of a bad time for UTEP and kind of also coming off of the NSF stuff. You know, the stuff UTEP's kind of in trouble. They're in the doghouse right now. It's not the best time, and unfortunately, they have to play politics. Yeah. All right. Two down. 30 minutes to go. Anthony Reifenberg is standing by. We'll join him in about 20 minutes during our final countdown. Find out what he's been up to as he gets ready to call Chihuahuas baseball tonight. He'll be with us uh, the remainder of the week for the Chihuahuas and the Las Vegas Aviators. Still to come, more calls, more sports talk right here. Taking you up till 630. It's 600 ESPN El Paso.